Welcome Hi, everyone. good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I would please call the roll. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Mr. Brennan? Present. Mr. Rickerman? Here. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Here. Mr. Vine? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Mayor Benjamin? Present. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Uh, Rev, would you give us a word, please? Yes. Let us pray. Look graciously, Creator God, upon this land of ours, where it is in pride. Subdue it. Where it is in need. We pray for you to supply it. Where it is in error, we ask that you might rectify it. Where it is in default, restore it. And where there is a hold in the very nature of grace and mercy, we ask for peace and compassion. We support it. We are undergirded by it. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rev. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Any amendments, sir? Osa? I'm just holding President Caslin's presentation, Mr. Mayor, until yeah. the next council meeting. Okay. Thank so you. Move. All right. All right. Um, is there a second? Second. Sure. Okay, move second discussion with the previous question. Call roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vaughn? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. And thank you. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? of May 12, June 2nd, and June 23rd, 2020? So moved. Uh, move, move second, any discussion? With the question, Kirk Carter. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye, thank you. Teresa. Yes, sir. The first item is the emergency ordinance, um, which is extending our mass ordinance, Mayor Benjamin and Council. Ordinance number 2020-087, an emergency ordinance extending certain emergency ordinances related to COVID-19. Right. Is there a motion? A move. Second. 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 And any discussion? Obviously, this clarifies the fact that we'll continue meeting in this uh, meeting posture um, uh, for the foreseeable future and also extends a mask ordinance uh, for, the, for the city of Columbia. we we'll the previous question of Kurt Carlo. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Moving into a period of City Council discussion items, our normal COVID-19 update, the Honorable Mayor Stephen K. Benjamin, to be followed by Mr. Harry Tinsley, Emergency Management Director for a COVID-19 situational report. And I know Harry may also throw in um, any activities regarding Hurricane Sally. Sure, and I'm going to I'm going to defer to uh, uh, Director Tinsley uh, in, in the, this incredible work that they've been doing. Not just keeping us surprised of, of, of everything we need to be doing, but also he and, and Hampton and others around around testing. I'll, I'll let Harry give his re report. Uh, the obviously at our next meeting we will um, be visited by um, President Kazan, who who was uh, anticipated to be at this meeting. We had a, a bit of a scheduling um, mix up. So we'll get him on here. Uh, we, we've seen obviously a positive impact from our, our masking ordinance, but we've seen some upward um, 
uh, pressures from the students who are re returning back. Uh, we're finding obviously um, some some pretty good compliance and uh, and uh, partnerships emerging. Um, um, uh, Teresa and your team, thank you for being diligent and, and, and making sure our policies are, are, are enforced. And and we all know as soon as we get our arms around the public health threat, we can we can uh, and get arms around economic challenges and, and then obviously the educational challenges our children uh, face. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, before Harry uh, goes on, un unrelated to the COVID uh, report, I, uh, Mr. Davis just reminded us, I just actually got a few text messages from some of our community leaders that we lost, Bill Manley. Um, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill uh, 91 years old, Sam, uh, one of our, our incredible community leaders, uh, stalwart and, and pushing for healthy, strong neighborhoods in a vibrant city uh, for decades. Uh, so we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna miss that old soldier. Uh, so um, 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 prayers to the Manly family. I want to make sure we do that. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Ms., uh, Ms. Wilson. Good. Go right uh, ahead, Harry. Hey, Harry. Hey, can y'all hear me? Sure can. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Madam City Manager again. Uh, just a quick update on some numbers and testing data um, within our COVID response uh, posture. So to date, our state is, uh, again, we we're over 1.1 million in testing. Uh, as of yesterday's case report out, we're 130,256 uh, confirmed total positive cases. Unfortunately, there have been 2,922 deaths due to COVID in our state. Here in Richland County, we are our case, uh, cumulative case totals are 13,242. Uh, we've seen some recent spikes, but we are starting to begin to level back off again on that data that's posting. Uh, again, unfortunately, uh, to date, 209 confirmed deaths due to COVID in the county. Uh, as far as testing in the city, uh, we staff continues to work very diligently to partner with area partners uh, to increase the testing capacity uh, in and around, but specifically in areas uh, of, of our city. And just a quick report out as far as our static drive-through testing location at uh, 2204 Lee Street, uh, still ongoing as of to date. Uh, there have been over 2,300 uh, test screenings completed uh, with a 12.3 positive uh, test rate. And the the other uh, is our CBS partnership with Benedict College over at 1903 Two Knots Road, which is continuing uh, ongoing. And these testing sites and information on their operation hours are on our website and all our media platforms. Uh, but to date, there have been uh, 1,111 test screenings completed at that location with a 14% positive uh, test rate. Um, as uh, this week, our municipal court, I'm sure you're aware, has reopened. Staff has worked very diligently. Our safety and risk uh, folks, uh, support services and other key staff, chief of staff and court personnel uh, to get ready uh, to do that. The, the install, they installed a, a thermal temperature scanner to ensure implementation of our COVID-19 safety procedures and the requirements for anyone entering the courthouse. Uh, our public and media relations staff, along with our court staff, created a video that is going to be available uh, out on our platforms so the public will know what the expectations are uh, from maintaining a high level of safety as we as we posture back into that capacity. Uh, currently, Richland County still remains at a high incident rate uh, based on our population, as does our neighboring Fairfield and um, uh, Fairfield County. Lexington, Richland, Newberry are at a moderately high, which is a step down. And Sumter and, and Calhoun, our other neighbors, are uh, at a moderate. So uh, as, as the mayor noted, uh, right now, currently uh, 11 counties and 61 municipalities have uh, mask ordinances in our state. And these jurisdictions continue to see over a 40% decrease in total cases. Uh, overall, South Carolina is in a downward trend. Hospitals continue to have sufficient capacity uh, and COVID-19 hospitalizations continue to trend downward over the past seven days. And if I will, if I could just, as Ms. Wilson said, uh, if I could go into just a quick thing on Hurricane Sally. Uh, as we know, the, the Gulf is experiencing uh, uh, 85 mile an hour wind hurricane that is moving very slow and that produces a lot of rain and can, uh, can really wreak havoc when they don't move. Hurricanes are, are best if they move, um, as, as y'all know that. But uh, as far as timing for any remnants of Sally coming through our area will be uh, Thursday, uh, Friday timing. 
And right now, the current uh, forecast models are indicating here in the mid or central Midlands of Britson County would be two to three inches of, of rain. We'll continue to monitor that um, and, and provide updates as, as warranted. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you so much. Mr. Mayor, excuse me one second. Harry, just for clarification, I know um, we're in the process of working with DHEC to stand up a different site. I'm not sure that um, it's ready to be publicly announced, but just wanted to note that in the event that those who have become used to the Lee Road site, Divine Street location, um, if it does close, there's another site that will be opening, correct? Uh, that's correct. In the close vicinity, uh, Ms. Wilson, and yes. that that location will relocate to another area within the city, and then fall back to that location after that timing of that additional site. We'll give some specifics as soon as we get more information on the uh, the finals uh, of preparation and site. Uh, that messaging will go out as well. That is correct. And then the temperature checking at the courthouse is a mandate by the Supreme Court um, Chief Justice. And of course, um, we definitely follow suit with that, um, with other public facilities. And whenever they do open, there is some guidance about not temperature checking the public. So I just wanted to make that distinction as well. Correct. Yes, yes sir. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Bill. Thank okay. You. Mayor, thank you. I do see our next wonderful presenter is queued up and ready, Ms. China Phillips with the Columbia Complete Count Committee co-chair for a census update. Hi, China. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I will be sure to make this quick. I know you have lots of things to do. So just to give you a broad strokes overview of everything. And can you hear me good? I'm getting some feedback. Okay. So broad strokes, um, South Carolina now stands 47th in the lineup. Nationally, um, we have a 65.9% uh, response rate to the census. This is not good, everyone, especially because our new deadline ends at, on September 30th. South Carolina stands um, at a statewide completion of 59.8%. And right now, the city of Columbia stands at 55%. Richland County is at 67, or actually, um, Richland County is at 61.7%. So um, what are we doing to ensure that individuals get as much information about the census as possible? Obviously, reaching out to you guys um, to make sure that we pull on both social capital and we expand out uh, census outreach within the communities that need it. So I thank you for being so responsive. Um, one of the people who has been integral to our success has been Krista Hampton because um, we have had to push out and make things happen quickly um, for the month of September end. So I just wanted to highlight three things um, that um, I'm asking that city council do. Um, and it has everything to do with sharing the information and getting it out to your partners. So I gave Ms. Hammond uh, some information earlier on um, just an event that we have coming up. Stacey Abrams' um, organization, Fair Count, and Mitch Landrews' um, Florbis Unum is teaming up to create an event um, called Census in the South, A Road to Recovery, where they go through multiple states and they chose South Carolina, of course, South Carolina is a Southern state and they chose Columbia as their only stop. So we are excited to have national eyes on the city of Columbia because of course, Columbia leads, so excited, but we wanna make sure that we get that information out because it's September 17th. And we um, chose to make sure that we highlighted youth and young leaders as um, the focus to figure out if the next 10 years, if we got everyone counted, what is the world that we want um, to look like in the future? And obviously our young people has the answers. So one of our very own Taylor Wright will be a panelist. So um, if you want to share it, um, I'm kind of guilt guilting you to share it because of Taylor, right? So he's a panelist and so hopefully we can share it and really support him and the others who are a part Councilwoman um, 
Shatir Neal is a part, Representative J.A. Moore, a high school student from C.A. Johnson, Wilhelmina Hunter, and Miss um, Claflin 2020 will be our panelists. So that's something that we want to get out and I have it um, an email for you. So she'll send that your way. The second thing is that we have a few joy tours coming up and it's really because we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're working within um, difficult circumstances. So in addition to encouraging our city of Columbia residents to fill out their census, we want to spread more joy because um, we can always use that. And, and of course, spread joy, not COVID, right? So um, we have two more um, events coming up and I thank you um, Councilman McDowell for making a point to come because we are right there in your backyard on our first one. Um, and then of course, Tamika Isaac Devine was there and her husband just and her kids, right? Just to make sure that they sh showed um, the residents that they are valued. So undercounted, but never undervalued. Um, and so we have two more, one in Arthurtown and that's a partnership with Richland County as well. And then the last in uh, Gable Oaks area um, and Belmont community. And then the third and final thing I wanted to highlight is that um, please, please follow um, us on social media because that's how you will get access to all of this information and just share it with all of your constituents. Um, because the more eyes, the more people who are engaged, the more times that um, individuals will be annoyed with hearing the information, hopefully they will share with someone to fill out their census. So for instance, a really good highlight is that tomorrow, AC Flora High School students, and I believe um, Councilman Rickman and um, Councilman Brennan, um, they're in your areas, but um, AC Flora High School students, they have um, got 35 student leaders who are going to be doing a phone banking event. So tomorrow we are going to just tally up how many calls they uh, did and make uh, just a thank you post. Um, and so we would love for you to share that. I believe Councilman Rickerman, you have something? Yeah, can, can you let me know what time they're gonna do that so that we can arrange to have some pizzas or something delivered to them as a thank you? Because that, that's, that's really commendable of them to, to step up and help. So um, I would love that. And I will definitely send uh, the information to you. I will say that our phone banking events are actually virtual. So um, we would love if you could pop on during that time just to say hi at the very beginning. That would be very, very great. Um, so that, that's one way that you could engage. But again, we are using our virtual platforms because we want to spread joy, right? Um, and uh, I will get that information your way. Yeah, well, maybe we can do something else then down the road to thank them. But I, I, I think that's commendable for those kids to do that. And anytime you have people that, that step up and volunteer, if you'll let us know about that, I think we should thank them. I think that's, that's fabulous. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and then in response to that, Mayor Benjamin was on a couple weeks ago at our last meeting, and we definitely do have to arrange a time to think through um, the committee, and then we'll share suggestions on how to thank the community, because we haven't seen as much support as we would want from the Federal Bureau, definitely the census workers on the ground, but our community has really stepped up to do um, some amazing things. I know Director Wilson and Mayor Benjamin gets random emails from me all the time, but that is just one drop in the bucket of how um, our community has really stepped up. So we will make sure to get some more information your way. Trying to, all the success that we have had is directly attributable to you and uh, team uh, Oddity and Rania and, and, and others. I mean, the whole, the whole squad, uh, young, young David, I mean, it's been, it's been um, great and just want to thank you for your leadership. I would be remiss if I still don't give credit to Ms. Levine for bringing you to us uh, um, and uh, just the, the identifying the amazing talent um, and, and you stepping up and, and standing in the gap. And, uh, and again, you already recognize Krista and her team. I mean, just uh, this, is, this is what community leadership is about. So you keep up the great work and we're thankful for your leadership. And I can't agree with Daniel Moore. Uh, these young people who see the, who see the value uh, uh, so early in life of stepping up and, and contributing to the, the body politic of this great country is, is, is very impressive. So we, we definitely want to recognize them. Ms. Devine? You're on mute. Um, I, I, I 
commend uh, China. I told her Saturday how, what an amazing job they've done. And uh, yes, we, the numbers are not where we'd like to see, but this has been a, an increasingly challenging year. We know it's already challenging for people to participate, encourage participation in the census. And this year it's been, you know, tripled, but they've done a, a yeoman's job with the circumstances. So I thank them. Um, just the thought, um, you know, how we all did those videos that we all pushed that uh, Alicia and her team pushed out on social media about the mask. Maybe we all can just type, uh, do something on our phones and let PR uh, send that out for the last couple of days, maybe to encourage um, a last push. Um, 15 days is not a lot. Um, and it, I, I kept using the 61% number and that was Richland County. And to now to know that the city of Columbia is actually 55, um, you know, that's, we've really got to, to push that up as much as we can. Okay. That'd be good. That's a great idea. I'd, I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much, Mayor. Um, and it, it's an honor to serve. And so I will probably bid you guys adieu now, right? Okay. Thank you, Madam. Everything. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay. Our next discussion item is um, our normal Clean Water 2020 program update. Mr. Clint Sheely, our Assistant City Manager for Columbia Water, and Brian Cully with CDM Smith. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen, and while I'm doing that, um, I also want to call to your attention one unrelated item um, of a pending retirement that uh, many of someone that many of you know well, uh, Mr. David Brewer, our city traffic engineer, has been in public service for over 31 years. He, David's going to be retiring on September the 30th. Um, and so I just wanted to, yes, sir, I wanted to bring that to y'all's attention. It's not, it's not going to happen, Clint. Uh, just tell David that's not going to happen. <laughs> Completely stop that in its tracks right now. So, uh, yeah, uh, man. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that's, that's wonderful. So happy, for, happy for him. So happy for him. Yes, sir. He really hates to see him go, man. He's, he's done a yes, lot sir. of work in the neighborhoods. He's outstanding and, um, big, big shoes to fill, but, um, but we're moving in that direction and um, have, have someone that, that is going to be able to help us in an interim role. And uh, we'll miss David, but we wish him well in his retirement. I knew y'all would want to know. So, um, so yes, sir, we'll move on to um, the business at hand, which is um, our Clean Water 2020 program update. Um, we are concluding our eighth year of services with CDM Smith as a business partner helping us manage our consent decree and, and really a lot of the programs within our, our wastewater collection system. They have acted as an extension of staff and are an integral part of our team and a big reason why we're in the strong compliance position that we're in with EPA and DHEC right now. Um, they're also helping us a little bit on the water side as well. And so we're using some of the efficiencies in terms of uh, how we map our mapped our collection system to map our water distribution system and um, that's really working well so far and um, so we're leveraging some of the lessons learned on one side of the house to help our overall utility operation we've asked brian cully with, with cdm smith to come present um, some more specific information and update and really that this is done to, to set the table and answer um, possibly preempt some of the questions that you may have about their their pending contract amendment, which is on your consent agenda, it's item 22 to, um, for this afternoon's meeting. So uh, Brian's got a few slides and information he's going to share with us, and then hopefully we'll have just a few moments for questions and answers. So I'll turn it over to Brian. Glenn, I wanted to quickly add, Brian is um, coming on, that council, you have this presentation as part of the um, email that Erica sent to you. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Wilson, and uh, thank you, Clint, for the introduction and agreeing to do the slides for me. So, uh, sorry, I can't be there in person with all of you this time. Um, today, I want to talk about the consent decree um, and really want to focus on some of the milestones and kind of look at where we are in that overall schedule and also highlight some of the impacts that the city's looking at. Next slide. All right. As far as the overall schedule, common question, just to recap for everybody, if you recall, the consent decree was actually signed 
and enacted um, by the EPA on May of 2014. And right now, based on the schedule uh, that we have, it looks like the last group of required projects are going to be ending and, and required to have a deadline by 2028. Um, so that kind of bookends the consent decree. Um, and 2028 is whenever we've finished all the required projects and would likely be able to then go to EPA and sort of petition to be relieved of the consent decree, basically get out. So if you kind of do the math there, you'll see that we're about halfway, coming up on the halfway point um, of that. Um, so far, we've uh, completed 16 of the 18 program submittals to EPA. You'll see the list here. For those of you that have been on council for a while, this list is very familiar. Um, it used to be all white as we've gone through and we've completed the consent decree programs to EPA. We've shaded them gray as we've gone down. And so you see there's only really two of the 18 consent decree programs left. Now, these consent decree programs take the 200 pages of requirements in the consent decree, and basically lay out how we're going to go about enacting that at the city. So once we do these uh, programs and submit the EPA, we then have to go and actually implement. And most of these go on essentially for the life of the consent decree. And so um, it's great to get those in and have those established, but it's work to be done essentially in perpetuity. And we keep track of all those implementation items. I want to call your attention. You'll notice that there's four of those programs that have red arrows off to the left of them. Those four programs with red arrows are essentially the programs that define infrastructure uh, required projects. Most of what you see on here doesn't have a red arrow and is O&M related. And so you can see that we've got the two programs that are left are infrastructure related. And the, the second one with the red arrow that just recently went in, the IR report, is also heavily on, on infrastructure. But you can see great progress here so far in submitting those. Okay, Clint. Um, kind of taking the, the alphabet soup, if you will, of the different acronyms of the programs on the left-hand side and how they all feed together, you can kind of see that infrastructure roadmap um, there. I think it's a lot easier to talk about the right-hand side of the slide that sort of lays it out in three steps. And so it's, we've been doing a lot of mapping of the sewer system. That was about an eight-year time frame. We have about two years left to go on that. We've also been spending a lot of the last couple of years doing condition assessment on the sewer system and figuring out what needs fixing. What's unique is that we're now entering that third milestone, which is to actually go out and do the rehab and the capacity improvements. So essentially we're thinking, or the essential way to think of it is we're entering the fix it stage. You'll always be doing the condition assessment, but we're now getting to where we're actually telling the EPA, we will do these certain projects and being held accountable to them. Okay, next slide. So the infrastructure projects, two of those programs that are important to note, uh, the first one is the IRR, the infrastructure rehab report. That's for the major part of the system, the 15 inch and larger pipes. It's about 10% of the system. That's already been submitted to EPA and we're awaiting approval um, of that. Um, and then soon in about 2022, we'll be submitting the supplemental IRR, which is for the smaller pipes in the system and smaller infrastructure, but represents 90% of your system. Um, those will be going, that'll be going into EPA again in 2022. And those two program documents contain a list of projects that we have to do by specified dates. If those projects aren't complete by those dates, you have to pay fine. The good news is we've started on a number of those projects already, projects that we had a high degree of confidence would be in those uh, program reports and required. We've started on many of them, not all of them, um, but do have a good head start there. Um, then a little bit later with the submittal of the CAP program to EPA, we're gonna have uh, projects that are required to ensure capacity within the system. Now, those projects that are required to ensure capacity in the system don't have the fines like the other projects, but if they're not completed in time, they do carry with them uh, a trigger for capacity limitations or moratoriums, uh, as, as we uh, commonly refer to them. What's important right now is everything's kind of up in the air with COVID, including funding and budgets, and CIP, P levels, but ensuring we have sufficient CIP levels to meet these project requirements in that IRR and SIRR, so we don't have to pay fines, or in the capacity um, improvement projects to make sure we don't have those moratoriums or capacity limitations will be critical. That's a tough time to be trying to uh, make all that work out. Uh, here on this slide, what you'll see on the left-hand slide, the original $750 million estimate, how it breaks down between a couple of different you know, cost buckets. On the right-hand side is how much we've done so far. So what you see is of the original $750 million estimate, we've so far had council approve about $312 million. And again, this is the money that has been approved at council. So say there's a consulting project to uh, do a capacity enhancing project, make a, make a pump station larger. If that's in the design stage, you've likely approved the um, consultant's contract. So that money would be uh, counted over on the right. But the construction dollars, which is where the larger amount is, 
um, if it's not going to then been approved by, by you and council, is not counted over there on the right hand side. So just to make sure you understand what's what's in that bucket and what's not. So again, about $312 million so far of the estimated $750 million. Okay. All right, as uh, Clint uh, mentioned, uh, tonight on the agenda is the renewal for year nine of the uh, consent decree uh, program support contract. This will be uh, year nine of an 11 year contract. And uh, this year again, like the last couple of years is characterized by a ramping down of the, uh, the level of effort. Uh, just to highlight a couple of areas that are ramping down and some others that, that aren't um, is the operations and management um, support. As you saw, a lot of those programs earlier were O&M heavy. And so we've helped write those documents. We've helped set up the practices and the policies and standard procedures to implement those. And for the last few years, been basically handing back that responsibility to the city for the ongoing implementation of the O&M items. That's been a huge effort that ramping down and shrinking of the, uh, the budget uh, and authorization each year. Um, some areas where the program is not able to shrink or is actually growing, I'll highlight two uh, very quickly. Uh, the first one is project management support and implementation. We help uh, oversee all the design consultants and uh, contractors um, in implementing the projects. And so right now we are managing 70, actually 70 plus active projects right now through the Clean Water 2020 program. And as we hit that exit stage uh, on the consent decree, that's not likely to slow down anytime soon. Uh, also, I'll point out, as, as Clint highlighted, some of the stuff that we're doing on the water distribution side, and you can see this on the next slide as well, um, going in and leveraging uh, some of those innovations and best management practices that we've put in place for O&M um, and asset management on the wastewater side, leveraging that over to the drinking water side is something that we can now do cost effective, efficiently, and quickly now that we've already shown how to do it on the wastewater side. So that's been a big part of what we've been doing. And Clint, if you'll flip to the next slide, you can sort of see that declining uh, authorization request every single year. And that's even despite a growing water, drinking water uh, support uh, portion of the contract. You can see that highlighted in blue versus the green that's wastewater. Okay. Uh, one thing I've not talked much about in the last few years, but I think it's, it's definitely time to, uh, to discuss a little bit, is our usage of subconsultants uh, on the clean water program. Again, this has been a large contract with the city. Um, and I want to remind you that there are 20 times that um, not the in, um, professional services contract um, at the city of this of the scale. Um, so to date, that means that $9 million, a little over about 9.1 actually, has been paid out to subconsultants on the Clean Water 2020 program. Again, those are ones that are contracted directly with CDM Smith on this contract that you'll be asked to approve tonight. Um, of that 10, I think it's important to note that eight of those 10 have local offices. That's very important. Um, nine of the 10 are DBE firms. Five of those being uh, minorities, seven women owned. And I think it's important, um, we're not just you know, basically signing up and, and, and working with those subs to kind of do a little, little piecemeal work here, a little bit there. We've made long-term commitments to these sub consultants and we're giving them a good base of work and base of operations. They can help grow and sustain their business. I think it's been a wonderful partnership. I, I know um, Clint would agree with me um, in saying that we would not have accomplished as much as we have on the clean water program without these subconsultant partners. It's, it's been really great. And even though it's not required, I really enjoyed sort of having a, a mentoring relationship with, uh, with several of them. And so it's been a great highlight of the program so far. Um, I know from listening to y'all's council meetings off and on, um, there's probably not a single part of city of Columbia that hasn't been impacted by COVID so far and Columbia water uh, is not immune either. And so as a result of that, um, working with attorneys and preparing a draft force majeure request for Clinton Joey's review, um, to go to the EPA, essentially ask for some additional time to implement some of these impacts. Staffing has been a significant impact. Um, obviously, the number one mission of uh, Columbia Water is to make sure we're meeting permit requirements and uh, providing customer service. The preventative maintenance that is a huge uh, part of the consent decree, takes a lot of man hours, has sort of been cannibalized a little bit to make sure that we're doing those other higher priorities. And so that's had a big impact to what we're trying to do with the consent decree. So that'll be front and center with the force majeure request. Um, also, the budgetary impacts to the CIP have been significant. Last year, we had an 80 million wastewater CIP. This year, we're, we're at 25 because of all that uncertainty. And so we're including that into the force majeure request as well. However, I do want to note, I don't think any of us really understand what the budgetary impacts are for the city at this point in time. And so we are going to try to leave it open with the EPA to say that, hey, in case some of these things become more long lasting, we may have to come back and, and increase or amend this force majeure request. So we're essentially leaving the door open uh, with that. 
Right, one very important note I want to make uh, and make sure everybody uh, hears today is to talk a little bit about hydraulic capacity. Since the consent decree was initiated back in May of 2014, the city's been allowed to continue using the same capacity assurance process that it had before the consent decree. So if somebody's building a 100 home subdivision or McDonald's, the process by which they make sure there's capacity in the system before they hook on has been allowed to essentially remain unchanged uh, by the consent decree. However, the consent decree does have um, generally more restrictive definition of capacity and a very detailed capacity assurance process laid out. And that timeline for those to go into effect is coming very quickly. As a matter of fact, we'll hit during uh, 2021 most likely. And what's um, very important to note with that is with these increasing uh, requirements, what's gonna happen is now capacity in the system is gonna be dictated by a consultant's hydraulic model. And so we're just now wrapping up that um, hydraulic model and so that will be used to determine capacity in the system. That is further, um, I guess I'll say aggravated or, or lowered or tightening of the definition if there's been an SSO due to wet weather um, that was caused by a less than two year storm, so a moderate storm if it caused an SSO, it's gonna further ratchet down uh, that available capacity. And so capacity will now be dictated by a model, not by um, some calculations and any known problems. So that's, that's becoming a little bit tougher. Um, the challenge is you know, now based on uh, updated information based on uh, updated projections as we're wrapping up the model, the capacity limitations or moratoriums may occur in portions of the system under the new cap criteria. Okay, so we may have in the near uh, future some some high priority projects that have very rapid turnarounds that we need to get out to try to avoid or minimize any of those uh, moratorium areas. We may be coming back to you with more information to talk about reshuffling some project priorities to make sure we try to meet uh, this challenge head on. All right, two other things I want to touch on briefly. Uh, next to last is going to be the defective private sewer laterals. Uh, for those who have been on council for a little while, you remember about a year and a half ago, um, us coming and talking to you about a requirement in the consent decree to notify homeowners when they have a defective private sewer lateral. So this is the pipe that takes the wastewater from their house out to the main line, and the homeowner owns the portion up into the right-of-way line um, or easement line of the sewer, of the main sewer that the city owns. Um, sometimes when we're doing condition assessment, such as smoke testing, it's very clear that these private laterals have smoke or that have, have defects for allowing um, I and I to get in, which eats up the capacity of the system. Um, so this requirement to notify those homeowners, um, we've got another large batch of letters that are about to go out. Um, and so just want to let you know that'll be happening soon. Um, we'll be coming back to you with more information to let you know where those are. And also wanted to remind you, um, as before in the last batch went out, there is no current punitive um, clause in the city's policy for those that do not um, repair their laterals. When the letter goes out, it does ask them to repair and notify the city. All right. Lastly, just wanted to touch on the sanitary sewer overflow update. Very brief here. I just want to let you know that the overall volume, looking at the last five or six years, the volume trend uh, remains to continue to be down, which is great news. And this is despite an incredibly wet um, December of 19 and first two months of this year, some of the wettest winter, I think, on record in a number of decades really gave us a large SSO count. But even despite that, the SSO volume trends are down. And uh, another note in helping that is the Lake Catherine uh, capacity project, which some of y'all are familiar with, is our current or most frequent SSO uh, site. Um, that project is wrapping up now and, and will be uh, in place here pretty soon. So we'll have our, our next biggest offender for SSOs taken care of here in the system as we continue to implement the rest of the system. So that was a lot in short order. I want to open it up for questions and see if there's anything else that you wanted to talk about or, or ask me your comments. Questions, Brian? Yeah, I don't see hands, guys. Uh, Mr. Davis. Um, I think I think that's a very good report. Um, I, I noticed when I was reading it, uh, we're very heavy with the uh, um, Project management, and I, I'm assuming that's because of the the, uh, the number of, of uh, repairs and, and the upgrades that we have to go through. Um, I, I think I have noticed a um, since the decree up to now, um, sanitary overflows have uh, have really dropped. Am I correct on that? Um, I would say that the number of uh, sanitary overflows have been pretty consistent the last few years. The volume resulting from those is significantly, significantly down. So if you're thinking of a chart that showed 
a massive drop that probably is showing volume. So volume is, mm -hmm. is down. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing which was educational for me was the uh, where, where we are with uh, a number of the projects and the contracts uh, year five of projected or contracted six or year four of contracted five. So that's how you we kind of really track internally in-house. That's what you do. You guys do. Yes, sir. I mean, in addition to keeping track of our contract, we we um, you know help provide project management services over over all the projects associated with clean water, um, and even some that are more city related. And so there's there's a, a number of that's where that seventy number was from. I think that little tag would be helpful, really moving forward. I know it's been a period of time since you've done it, but if we can look at that periodically, more periodically, to where we are with the contract that we've let, and where we are with either renewing or um, uh, finalizing it, that, that helps. It helps. I know it helps me. Yeah, great. So and and to, this, to this point, Mr. Davis, a lot of the projects that we're doing have been ones that we knew were going to be on those right. lists of must do projects with EPA. And so, but they haven't had definitive timelines yet. We kind of knew what they were, but they hadn't been approved by EPA and, and the official clock hadn't started yet. But very soon, uh -huh. we're going to have a lot of projects on the clock. And so I think, uh, You'd like to see more information and status of those that's something we can definitely provide to you yeah and that that would be helpful i mean so that we can even uh, yeah, yeah, address public oh. questions because of, you're right there's a, there are a heck of a lot of number of uh, contracts out there the dollar values are, are high but but the results are uh, um are what we paid for and so uh, that's good thank you uh, Mr. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Um, let me thank you all for that report. Just one follow up uh, project that I'd, I'd like to certainly inject. Clint, where are we with the Beverdale project and how do how are we meshing all of that in? Yes, sir. Um, that that project is part of our stormwater capital improvement plan. Um, so Brian and his team are, are managing our wastewater services, councilman. Um, but uh, we we have actually uh, procured consulting services for Belvedere improvements, and those are under design now. That one is that that's one of the few that Brian's not helping us manage. Um, we're, we're we're doing that um, separately through our stormwater plan. But yes, sir. All right. Good. Just wanted to get just wanted to make sure we got that on the uh, radar. On the radar. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of Brian and Clint? No, no. Thank you. You guys keep up the great work. Let's keep let's keep on keep on pressing. It would be it would be helpful. I, I, uh, I'll see if it's in this document. But the question Mr. Davis uh, had about SSOs, uh, no, although the, the frequency is maybe not abated, and the volume is down significantly. But, um, um, if you wouldn't mind, just maybe. Uh, put in the top of my inbox that 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 chart that usually is very helpful and instructive would be great. Okay. Certainly, I'm right. sure I'd be happy to do that. Right. We've got that. It's just a matter of sending out. I'll have uh, I'll get that to Clint right away and get that to y'all. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Brian. You. Thank you, Clint. Thank Mr. Mayor, at this time we have made it to the consent agenda item six through twenty-seven. A motion. Uh, to approve consent agenda items six through twenty-seven. Move uh, approval of item agenda agenda items uh, six through twenty-seven on the consent agenda. Second. Second. All right. Moved and second. In discussion. Um, uh, all those in favor say aye. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Madam, sorry, Madam. Uh, I think it's Madam. The roll. I keep forgetting. A lot like, quicker that one. <laughs> it's, a, a lot, it's a lot. I did. I, I was. I was thrown off because I did want to point out. Obviously, a number of important things in here. I encourage people to look at the agenda, but including you know the adoption of the revolving loan fund uh, for, for yeah. care, and, yeah. loans, and also you know, so it's, it's, there's some good stuff in there and uh, some good action. So, um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Absolutely, Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Uh, Mr. McDowell? Yes. 
Yes, Mr. Duvall. Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you for saving me, Erica, before one of our multiple parliamentarians on this call uh, tried to check me. I appreciate it. Um, okay. uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks, uh, yes, sir. Moving into a period of ordinances, first reading, item 28. Ordinance number 2020-076, repealing ordinance number 2014-079, granting an encroachment to Kenzel F. Summy and Allison Renee Lee for placement and maintenance of a steel palmetto tree with concrete foundation within oh, the sidewalk. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? Um, with the previous question, Clark Carl Rowe. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 29, ordinance number 2020-090, granting an encroachment to Richard Latson and Jeanette Latson for the use of the right-of-way area of the 700 block of Abelia Road for the installation and maintenance of a garden wall, landscaping, and irrigation adjacent to 701 Abelia Road and 3827 Devine Street. No motion. So move. Second. Move. Second. Discussion. We'll move the previous question. Kurt Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Benjamin, as we move into the public hearing and first reading for zoning planning matters, I think we have one item at the beginning that is in your neighborhood, sir. Item 30, the um, annexation and zoning map amendment. Right, well, I'm a, I wouldn't mind trying to go get a cup of coffee. Okay. Ed, but Ed has proven himself rather uh, efficient lately, so I'm not sure it's possible. <laughs> but I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll step, I'll step, I'll, I'll step off for a moment. And uh, wait, wait, wait the high sign. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I'm going to hand off to Ms. Hampton at this point in time. Good afternoon. Hi, Krista. Hello. <laughs> It, you may want, let's wait until Mayor Benjamin gets back on before you take that point of personal privilege, okay? Absolutely. Well, maybe I'll wait till at the till the end. Um, the, either way, or great. whenever he gets back on, either way. Great. Sounds great. We'll do yep. this first one here. Okay. Uh, let's forward. There's not, there we go. All right, public comment for the zoning public hearing. In addition to viewing the meeting at the city's website, the public may comment via telephone. When calling, please include your name and address. The public may listen to the audio and participate in the meeting via telephone at the number listed. And it's also was published on the agenda. When prompted, enter the meeting code 8608. And one will allow you to listen and you can stay on the line until your case is announced. When it is called, you can either press star two to leave a voice message to be played back or star three to be placed in the speaker queue. City staff will unmute callers and callers are limited to three minutes. If you are participating by phone prior to speaking, please make sure you mute any other audio on your devices before you speak to avoid any feedback. The first case is an annexation at 166 Riding Grove Road. This is a request to annex and assign a zoning of PUDR. It is PDD in Richland County. And Councilman McDowell, I'm not sure if there's any um, public who wants to speak on this request. I'm just making sure I'm in the right place. Yeah, I am. 
Madam Clerk, are there persons to speak for it or against it? Um, Mr. McDowell, we have one caller on the line, and I am not sure if this caller is about calling for this case, so I would have to unmute the caller and ask the question, and if they are not calling about this case, they will need to be re-added to the speaker queue when that item comes up. Yes, ma'am. Please do that. Thank you. Thank you. I am actually waiting for um, item number 37. Okay, at this time, I am going to end your speaking session and when your item is called, please press star three to rejoin the speaker queue. Thank you. I'll do it, thank you. So at this time, there are no other callers waiting to be heard. That's for either against it or for it, right? Yes, sir, for item 30. All right. So moved. All second. right, is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and probably a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Sure, Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vaughn? Aye. Mr. Davis. You're muted, Mr. Davis. I'm sorry. You vote, I, you voting in favor? How do you yes. vote? Okay. Yes. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, sir. Item 31. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, Ms. Wilson alluded to um, a point of personal privilege I wanted to take once the mayor had returned. Is he back on yet? Um, I don't see everyone. You don't, you don't, you don't see all, all this right here? I oh. did I do not. <laughs> oh, come on, Teresa. We're, well, we're, we don't, we're, you know, in the presentation mode, so I can only see five of you. I'm sorry. I'm back there. Okay, go ahead, Krista. Thank you. Um, it seems we, we have a number of departures to announce this evening. And I, I sadly um, report to you that we are losing John Fellows. He is um, moving out of state and been with us nearly 10 years, has made a tremendously positive impact on this city and will be missed dearly. So I wanted you all to know that last week, uh, next week will be his last week. So this is uh, on the Zoom and this is his last council meeting. Uh, <laughs> Pastor, Can we make a rule from, that like uh, during COVID, cause we can't like get together and hug each other that people can't leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amazing impact, John. I think, I think that, that that's, um, I know how much Krista uh, thinks of you, uh, but the, uh, that, that may even be the understatement. You, you, you've been an amazing gift to the people of the city and, and completely changed the, the, the way in which we see connectivity and walkability and bikeability and uh, just a, a real leader. And um, I know you will be a, an asset, both you and your wife and a great dream team uh, to your new community. Well, thanks. It's, it's really been a pleasure to work for uh, Columbia and all of you, as well as all the citizens. It's, it's been a really great decade. So thank you very much. I we'll miss you, John. Absolutely. All this this great institutional knowledge, Mayor and Council, between John and David. Um, anybody? Anybody else quitting today? Anyone no, else? No. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Okay. Just make sure well, you got to build a bench. This is what I always say because it hey. happens. And um, yeah. True. And I'm, I'm I'm happy to report that um, Lucinda Statler has agreed to serve as our interim planning administrator. So. Oh, good. All right. Awesome. Awesome. No, fantastic. Thanks again, John. Uh, we, we, we're going to miss the heck out of you, brother. All right. All right. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, John. Go ahead, Krista. Thank you for that indulgence. All right. Going ahead to an annexation with zoning map amendment at 2125 Apple Valley Road. It's a request to annex and assign a zoning classification of RG1. 
All right. Is anyone here to speak in favor of or against this? All right. Uh, seeing none. No one is in the speaker queue, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Erica. Is there a motion? So moved. Move to approve. All right. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? We'll move the previous question. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duval. Aye. Mr. Lai. Sorry, aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. The next station was zoning map amendment at 906 Brantley Street, a request to annex and assign a zoning of single family residential RS1. Is anyone here, um, um, Madam Clerk, to speak in favor of or against this? Uh, no, sir. And at this time, we'd like to remind callers that if they're interested in speaking on an item, they will need to press star three. All right. Um, seeing none, is there a motion? So move, Mr. Mayor. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Discussion. We'll move the previous question. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duval. Aye. Mr. Vine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye, thank you. Annexation with a future land use and zoning map amendment at 3801 Eureka Street, a request to annex and assign a land use classification of UCR1 and a zoning of RS3. Is there anyone here to speak uh, in favor of or against this, uh, Madam Clerk? No, sir. All right, is there a motion? Move approval. Is Second. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. Clerk, call roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Annexation with future land use and zoning map amendment at 3834, 3836 West Beltline Boulevard, a request to annex and assign a land use classification of AC2 and a zoning of C3. Does anyone here to speak in favor of Hammond? No, sir. All right. Is there a motion? Move so approval. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll move the previous question. The court call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vaughn? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benson? Aye. Thank you. Annexation with future land use and zoning map amendments at, at for an 18.1 acre portion of 300 Clemson Road. Request to assign a land use classification of UEMR, urban ed residential, and a zoning of RG2. No. Is anyone uh, here to speak in favor of or against this? All right. No, sir. Ma'am? No, no, sir. All right, super, thank you. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Uh, the previous question, Clerk Carl Rowe. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? 
Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. And just a reminder for those on the call, if they wish to participate, once the case is called, you can either press star two to leave a voice message to be played back or star three, which will in essence raise your hand to be placed in the speaker queue. And remember to turn off any audio while you're speaking. The next case is at 1232 Whitaker Drive. This is a zoning map amendment and a request to rezone the parcel from RS1 to RS2. Is anyone here speak in favor of or against this matter? Mr. Rick, oh, I'm sorry, anyone, anyone uh, Madam Clark? No, sir. All right. Um, well, I'll, you, I'll go ahead and ask you a question before I get into motions, Mr. Rick. I'm sorry. You have a question? Uh, well, no, I actually have spent a great deal of time um, working with the developer and talking to several of the neighbors. And what I would suggest here and would like to present to council, and I'm gonna do it in a motion, is that we give first approval of the rezoning, but uh, the developer has agreed to split the lot into two equal lots and put a deed restriction um, along with adding uh, adjacent neighbors to that deed restriction so that the property will stay as two single families and not convert into multiple, which is the, the big fear among the neighbors. Um, the house does connect to RS2 and is surrounded. The neighborhood's very split in RS2 and RS1, as you can tell from the picture. Um, so it's not out of character, but the unknown of possibly a third house being built is, is the real concern. So after talking to Mr. Carlisle, he's in between first and second reading to try to go ahead and get um, the property split, uh, platted and survey deed restrictions put in and potential drawings of the two single family homes to share with the neighbors before we would give it second reading. So I plan on making that in the motion at the appropriate time, but wanted to bring everybody up to speed. I, know we all, I think we've all got some communications from citizens on that. We've gotten some from Ms. Mm -hmm. Oker and Ms. Burkheiser. Do you know if, if Mr. Carlisle, anyone shared those thoughts with the, with some of the, uh, uh I know. Renneke was, uh, I, I'm sorry, Mayor Bench. Yes. I, you, I've got a bad uh, connection here, Mayor Benjamin. I'm sorry. Right. <coughs> we can hear you. I don't. I, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Y'all, y'all can hear me. Yes. <laughs> quite, quite well, Mister Carla. <laughs> <laughs> Give my checkbook going downstairs. I don't need that. I. I All right, uh, Erica. How many folks we have signed up? And I certainly give them the the, the the right to present. This is unreal. Any thoughts first? Um, Mayor, I have one one caller holding to speak. I'm not sure if it's a, in reference to this particular case, but I would like to add them to the meeting just to find out. Yeah, but, but before you do that, Erica, one second. So can we can Miss, Mr. Carlisle? We can hear you. Can you hear us? I can, I can hear you now. It was terrible for a minute there. Okay, bro. Um, well, and I, mm -hmm. well, go ahead, please. I'll, I'll just, I'll just. On again. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll just try to get to the minutes, but I suppose when Rick stated was that um, if I would be willing to commit to doing only two houses and uh, get that in writing with uh, deed restrictions and so forth with a real estate attorney, y'all would um, approve that at this reading. And um, in, the, in the meantime, I'll get the, all the paperwork set up. And then at, at the second reading here in a couple of weeks, we'll um, try to try to proceed. That, that's what Mr. That's what Mr. Destin articulated. 
Uh, have you, have you, um, I've been believing that that's um, what y'all were just discussing. Yeah. Did you, uh, I'm have sorry. You, yeah. Have you had a chance to discuss that with any of the neighbors just yet or, or, or um, no? yes, sir. I, I have spoken to a lot of the neighbors about it, although there is quite a bit of misinformation out there. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of people out there who are convinced that, um, I'm going to put three houses on the lot. Um, I have no intention of doing that, and I, I offered to, to put it in writing the, on July the 15th, but they said there was no such thing as contractual zoning, so that wasn't an option at that point. All right. The, um, uh, I, I encourage you to uh, listen to Mr. Rickman's direction. Uh, Krista, based on what you've heard, does this, does this address some of the uh, issues raised by the neighbors? Uh, there has been a concern about the, the being able to construct three houses and, and Mr. Carlisle is correct. We Council cannot condition zoning, but certainly you can feel better about approving a first or second reading based on right. certain things occurring. Sure. All right. Good deal. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Um, uh, Ms. Hammond, you want to see if the other uh, caller ha is, is on this particular item? So that caller has left the speaker key, so I think we're okay. All right, Mr. Rickman, you have a motion? Yes, sir. I, I would move for first approval uh, with the understanding prior to second approval that Mr. Uh, Wade Carlisle, the developer of this site, will bring uh, a, a plat that has uh, divided the lot uh, to uh, reflect the setbacks and the zonings that are required for the two lots there. Had the deed restrictions uh, put together uh, with an attorney and recorded and provided us and the neighborhood with a snapshot of the potential buildings um, for those two lots. Daniel, let me ask you a question. Can I get a second? I second sir? the motion. I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Duval. Uh, Mr. Discuss Mr. McDowell. Yes. Now I've gotten this, gotten a, an inordinate amount of email saying that it was three houses being built. Now are we clear that it's two instead of three? Yeah, because when we divide the two lots and put the deed restriction, deed restriction causes it to only be one house per lot. Okay. <clears throat> All right, that's what I needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bless you. All right. Thank. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, bless you, brother. Yeah. The um. Let's just make sure. I, I I got a handful of emails. Just to make sure we communicate with the citizens who reached out to us on this. Um. It's it's moving seconded. Any uh any further discussion? Um. I see no other no other hands. Let's move the previous question. Clerk Carwell. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. And let's just impress upon, obviously, we know our, our abilities and our limitations. Let's impress upon Mr. Carlisle the importance of haste in getting this done pretty quickly uh, so we, we can we can all be on the on, on board uh, uh, by, by the time we meet again all right thank you all right krista yes sir next case is a zoning map amendment for 901 903 11 and 919 south Edisto avenue this is a request to rezone the parcel from white industrial m1 to general residential rg2 okay. um uh is there uh, a, a a motion or oh, oh, sorry chris is anyone here to speak in favor of or against this yes sir we have callers joining the speaker queue now all right thank you thank you let's uh let's let's, 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 let's go and get them going um all right yes sir understands the the the, the land, land please
Hi, I'm John Paris, the vice chair and uh, of the Richland County Airport Commission and a corporate pilot. I want to thank you for letting us speak today regarding this rezoning request. The FAA has issued a no hazard finding indicating the proposed development does not penetrate part 77 airspace. The FAA is not addressing incompatible land use. It is merely stating it's finding that the proposed development does not violate the height restrictions imposed by the airport's imaginary surfaces off the end of our runway 13. The South Carolina Aeronautics Commission issued a finding that though it doesn't penetrate the part 77 airspace, the proposed development is a safety concern and an incompatible land use because of its proximity to the airport. The commission has sent each of you copies of that finding. The developer's engineer noted to the planning commission that the aeronautics commission view was myopic in the greater context of the surrounding area. I would contend that this is not myopic. It is the interest of safety, safety and the general public. In short, high density housing and aircraft operations are just not compatible. And the planning commission presentation, the developer's attorney also advised the planning commission that development of this type should not be the airport's direct concern and should not be the airport's primary direct interest to restrict property use. The airport's goal would to be to pose no restrictions on anyone. However, and once again, some activities are just not compatible with others. Separate, separating those incompatible land uses is a primary objective of any rezoning regulation. The current M1 zoning has already accomplished that separation. The Planning Commission was told that proximity to the airport should pose no specific problem, critical hazard, or public safety issues. Safety is the number one issue in just about everything aviation related and is an issue here. Though incidents are seldom and unlikely, exposing high density residential to close proximity aircraft operations is just not good practice. The South Carolina Aeronautics Commission has written the city letter saying so and allowing such proximity has consequences. Thank you very much for letting me present today. I appreciate you taking this under advisement. Thank you. All right. How many people do we have in the Erica? Uh, currently, I believe we have four additional callers in the queue. Super. Okay. Thank you. Let's, 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 let's keep hearing people out. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next caller, I believe, is uh, Mr. Chris Eversman. And I'll add him to the queue. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Eversman. I'm the airport general manager for the Jim Hamilton L.D. Owens Airport, 1400 Jim Hamilton Boulevard, Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you for letting me speak today regarding this rezoning request. Another purpose of zoning is to protect some aspect of quality of life by land use regulation, allowing incompatible land use such as residences near aviation operations is not conducive to quality of life. The management and the commission of the airport are proud of the limited number of noise complaints we get each year. We take each one of them seriously in order to maintain quality of life standards in the surrounding neighborhoods. <clears throat> It was noted by the developer's attorney to the planning commission that the property has sat idle for some time. That idleness and proximity to rail and air operations depresses property values and creates an excellent opportunity for low cost property and long term returns for development. Development at that location is fine for commercial, industrial, or other land uses that act as a transition and a buffer to residences, but it is not acceptable for high density housing from a safety and quality of life standpoint. Our airport is the most landlocked airport of its class in South Carolina. Allowing incompatible residential encroachment in that proximity to the airport will hinder future uses and opportunities for the airport to serve the city, county, and the Midlands. A study is currently being performed by the airport that may or may not indicate a need for an extension of runway 13. The extension would be in the direction of the city center in this property. The possibility of that extension has been master planned and part of the public record since 2011. Should the extension come to fruition, it will move the runway protection zone and the airport airspace closer to the proposed multifamily development. This will promote neither safety nor quality of life. Therefore, we, along with the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission, oppose this rezoning request. Thank you for your consideration. Thank 
you very much, Mr. All right. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Good afternoon. My name is Joel McCreary and I'm the chair of the Richland County Airport Commission. Thanks for letting me speak today. Um, I hope you've all read the letters sent by myself and my colleagues regarding this issue and I'll be brief. The Jim Hamilton L.B. Owens Airport has been an economic, business, recreational, and community threshold to the city and county for over 90 years. It plays an important role in our community, state, and national infrastructure. Incompatible land use encroachment is a common threat to urban airports throughout the U.S. The airport, as an important part of our community infrastructure, deserves the city's stalwart stewardship and protection. Each council member has a responsibility today to preserve the safety and quality of life affiliated with the airport that others before us have worked so hard to protect, including city and county councils, the Richland County Airport Commission, airport management and operators, and the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission, just to name a few. Our stewardship of such an important infrastructure asset is crucial to meet today's and tomorrow's needs and challenges. It is an irreplaceable asset. Please protect our community asset and deny the rezoning request from M1 to RG2, and thank you for your consideration. Fantastic architects in the community. Thank you, John. All right, uh, Madam Clerk. Well, hi, my name is David Brandes. I'm an engineer with Yale Robinson. Uh, I'm at 1301 Gervais Street. I've lived and worked in Columbia my whole life and uh, worked extensively in the Rosewood area. Um, I'm speaking in favor of the uh, project. I'm working with the developers. Uh, what we're looking for is, change, is a, seeking a change from an M1 designation to an RG2 for about 8.64 acre site, the former Bagner Builder site. The RG2 is, uh, is, is really what's zoned around us. Uh, there's a significant amount of RG2, and I think someone before mentioned that M1 would be a good uh, buffer transition to RG2. I don't think we ever consider M1 as a buffer to residential. It's the highest, most intense uh, zoning we could possibly have. Uh, the RG2 would allow us 16.4 units per acre, which would allow up to 141 acres, but that's not what's being proposed for this property. Proposement is for 90 units, mainly a townhome style apartments, two to three score uh, uh, women. Um, it'd be a lower density transition um, from the single family homes that are adjacent to us to some of the other light industrial uses. Um, to rezone, our rezone request from M1 to RG2 is going to help correct some balances of uses in the city, which just have not met the market need. And one of the reasons this property is set, um, set vacant is that there's not significant transportation to support the M1 use. Uh, believe me, if there was significant um, need for M1 at this property, the last decade or so, somebody would have taken a look at it. Um, the units cater to workforce housing needs in the city, a product that's really needed. Um, most of the other residential projects that have come before you recently have either been high density student housing or um, large suburban. Hello, I'm John Ferris, Vice Chair, Richard County Edge. Airport Commission, and also Corporal Pilot. I'm sorry, am I still being heard? Yes, sir, please continue. Okay. And sorry. we have a There's three minute time answer. limit. Okay. Um, the site has a number of environmental concerns, uh, which the developer is being uh, is clearing up. Um, just want to point that out, as well as um, an opportunity to fix a lot of the stormwater issues. We've completed our traffic uh, um, investigations and the met with SCDOT. Um, it is an extremely low traffic area, uh, and this um, um, creation of traffic would uh, would not hinder that. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission. There's no question that the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission is focused on aeronautics. And one of the things we want to point out is that um, in that area, 
um, 33.5% of the existing parcels are single family homes. Uh, to say that you need to protect this um, urban airport from single family uh, just doesn't really meet what, what is there now, single family. Um, really would only be talking about a change from 33.5% to 34%, a 1.5% change in the amount of residential is located in the RPZ approach. I did want to point out one of the reasons the FAA gave us that no obstruction letter is because the RPZ is a three-dimensional yeah, object. Point, David. We have to wrap this. Yeah, we got to wrap it up. Yeah, we got to wrap sure. this. Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap that up with. I'll wrap it up with that comment then. Well, finish your thought. Finish your thought. It's okay. Okay. Well, um, the RPZ, the, the safety approach, is a three-dimensional um, um, entity. So because this property is further away from the airport and further away from the potential expansion, we're out of the glide zones. We're, and so that's why FAA says we don't have an, uh, an obstruction. And we don't. So if, you, if you're just looking at land, you know, things like Henley Homes, things like all of the um, property that's in uh, that part of Shandon would also be in those um, safety issues. So to say now that these homes would present a safety issue makes you wonder, you know, what about the homes that are there now? Oh, super. That's the end of my thought. Thanks, no, Steve. No, thank you, man. You take care. All right. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk. Erica, do we have other? Um, um, yes, yes, you got. There you go. Dear Mayor and Council, this is Columbia Attorney Mike Kelly, who's been practicing law in the city of Columbia longer than Steve Benjamin and Tameka Isaac Devine put together. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> that's a good thing or bad thing, Mike. Well, I don't know either. I just felt like saying it. Um, I Today, I've got my airport commission hat on. And I think there are real and valid reasons to oppose this rezoning request, request that's pending before you. The rezoning request before council today proposes this 90 multifamily high density development only 2,300 feet from the current end of the Jim Hamilton L.B. Owens Airport Runway 13. In the July 13th Planning Commission meeting, the development Proposed zoning is in with the proposed UDO employment campus land use classification, which encourages multifamily redevelopment and infill. However, from the city and other planning studies I have reviewed addressing this area, it appears that some sort of transition zone was attempted by each, buffering the airport and rail operations from residential development. Some of you old timers may recall that the Jim Hamilton L.B. Owens Airport historically had intersecting runways up until the early 1980s. At that time, the airport was reconfigured to its current single runway alignment to minimize residential overflight for safety and noise abatement. Approval of further residential encroachment directly off the end of the runway 13 contradicts that original effort and the substantial public monies that have already been spent precisely to avoid this situation. High density housing in close proximity to rail and aircraft operations. I would urge you on behalf of the commission to uh, make a finding against the rezoning of this property. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All, All right. right. Madam Clerk. Hello, I'm John Hodge. I'm the attorney for the South Carolina Aeronautics Commission. Mayor Benjamin, members of council, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. The Aeronautics Commission is the state agency that is charged with the oversight of airport development, maintenance, safety, and land use. And in three minutes, I'll try to summarize the, the commission's concerns. Um, we do have a letter that's part of your packet, and we would certainly crave reference to that for additional information. First off, the uh, Aeronautics Commission is concerned regarding the city's you know, potential compliance uh, with uh, the state code 
The state code basically says that governments and local agencies shall take into account the presence of airport land use zones and airport safety zones and consult with the division uh, when, uh, prior to making land use decisions. In addition, if the division provides comment within 30 days, the governmental body must respond substantively to each comment separately stated before issuing an approval. The Aeronautics Commission did provide comments on uh, June 6, 2020, which have not been addressed as of yet. Furthermore, land use decisions by county municipal governments and local agencies shall take into account the, the existence of airport land use zones. And they also, land use decisions should minimize the impact to the interruption of aircraft operations, aviation safety, and uh, other criteria or other items uh, in, in accordance with FAA criteria as well as uh, any other nationally recognized criteria. Now, we will say that we'll tell you today that right now this proposed project is in the inner approach zone and also on the runway protection zone. And to respond to Mr. Brandes, let me just say that you know, you know, these rules you know, don't address grandfathered properties, people that have been around for quite a while, but for new properties, they do apply. And so it's clear uh, to us, and it's clear at commission's findings of incompatibility that the sort of land use that's proposed is not suitable off the end of a runway. And uh, that is a serious concern. Now, the Aeronautics Commission doesn't want to have to go to court to enforce Title 55 of the state code against the city or the developer. We don't really want to do that. We have no interest in doing it. But certainly we want to make sure that in the city's decision, it d does comply with these rules. Uh, and secondly, the proposed project violates the land use guidelines of the FAA and the Aeronautics Commission in that there's high density development off the end of the runway. At the current location, uh, if this project were permitted, aircraft would be flying as low as 42 feet over these homes, over these residences. And as soon as that starts, noise complaints starts. And this is a hazard also, not only to people on the airplane, but to people on the ground as well. The FAA approved master plan, as Mr. Eversman has mentioned, you know, has a runway extension. And if that runway extension goes in, then you would have airplanes flying 19 feet over this development. So these rules, land use criteria were set up for major reasons, public safety and harmonious land uses. And granting those developers request would create an immediate land use conflict, a safety conflict. It would, route, it would create an airport noise issue. Now, uh, the developer claims that the, uh, the airport uh, is not a hazard to air navigation. When the FAA reaches a decision like that, that's based upon towers and height, but it, it does not address the FAA's land use criteria, which is quite significant. So the, aircraft, the Aeronautics Commission is also charged by the legislature with, with representing the public interest to ensure that there's harmonious land use around South Carolina's public use airports. And we would urge you to consider that. And aviation is generally a safe activity, but we're trying to prevent uh, issues where there might be an accident or an incident. So in summary, I will just uh, tell you that uh, I would urge you to follow the recommendation that the staff to deny, uh, ask you to deny the rezoning and comply with Title 55. And the Aeronautics Commission also is available to meet with the city and uh, county uh, staffs as, uh, to address the future zoning issues in the vicinity of the airport. And that is actually planned at this time. Thank you very much. I do appreciate your consideration. Thank, thank you, John. It's good to hear from you, hear your voice. I haven't seen you in a while and I hope you and your that superstar child of yours are doing well. All right, so good deal. Uh, any other uh, folks online, Erica? Yes, sir. We have four callers in, in the queue. All right, let's go. Let's do it. All right. Hi, hey guys. This is Jeff King. There you go, Jeff. Please. Hi, hey, Jeff King, Stratus Development Group. Thanks for having us this afternoon. Um, so we're, we're excited about the project. We've uh, title it the Rosewood, which would bring needed workforce housing and desirable two bedroom and three bedroom plans to an area of Columbia and in need of positive growth. Uh, as a part of that development, uh, a blighted property with lingering environmental issues will be reborn as a productive and positive addition to the community. Um, the infrastructure concerns are minimal with the boutique size of this development. Um, contrary to what has been mentioned before, this is not a mega development, it's not high density, it's not a 500 unit complex. This is a 
townhome style, two story, low density, matches the surrounding community uh, project. From the outset of this development, we've strived to be a good neighbor and acting in good faith, uh, rather forcing a mid-rise community on this site as has been proposed in the past. We opted to downsize the proposed community voluntarily to a townhome style that's more conducive to neighboring uses. We're, we're working closely with state authorities to clean up environmental issues and even offering to pay for such cleanup ourselves. Um, additionally, there are lingering stormwater issues in the area that will be mitigated by the additional stormwater detention facilities in the community. Uh, the vast majority of people we've talked to have been in support of the project as it brings continued positive growth to the area, displaces no one, is low impact, and use is more fitting with the neighborhood than what is currently allowed. The RG2 zoning contemplating matches exactly with the surrounding properties. The current M1 zoning, however, is not desirable. Um, it's been vacant in sale countless years, proving that the current use is, is not needed. And also what is allowed, um, M1 allows for things such as outdoor kennels, a truck terminal, even a chemical distributorship, things that are not good for, for a neighbor. <laughs> uh, from the perspective of the city, this is the type of development that's been talked about for years. Workforce housing with desirable floor plans, with absolutely zero government subsidies. Um, I do want to harp on that. Uh, unfortunately, the only local opponent of this development has been the local airport authority. Keep in mind, we meet all the safety criteria laid out by the FAA and by it supersedes the local airport, as proven in the FAA's no hazard letter, which pertains to this development. Additionally, we have emails on file from March 2019 from the airport authority clearly stating the subject parcel is not in the runway protection zone, either currently or even a proposed airport extension comes to fruition. There's been a deliberate backdoor campaign of misinformation by the airport commission to sidetrack this development for their own personal reasons. I hate that. Uh, we had only been forwarded objections by the airport and those connected with it, most are nebulous in nature today, proving there's no effort by the airport to work together, but to work against each other on this project. It seems there's been false information in the airport circulated effort to maximize the scent. We've met with the airport commission in good faith to present our plan but found that a letter had been written opposing the project before we even got there. From the outset, we've been diligent with communicating with neighboring associations, multiple emails to uh, Edison Court, Rosewood, South Kilburn, South Waccamaw, uh, Holly Rose Hill, in addition to all those in the city council, the airport authority, economic development, and direct neighbors. Uh, we're not trying to pull the wool over any, anyone's eyes in this development. Uh, to dispel a few rumors that have recently surfaced in the project, the project is exclusively two bedroom and three bedroom units named workforce housing. This is neither intended to be a student dormitory or high density development. The request is not designed as such. These units are all two stories. Now, the permitting developers will meet all traffic guidelines work with DOT to ensure process traffic flow. They will self park, not require any street parking. Stormwater issues will be decreased, not increased by the addition of stormwater detention facilities. We do welcome the opportunity to work together rather than against the airport and make this work for everyone. Um, uh, one resident uh, that, that was mentioned packet mentioned we made no efforts to reach out to the neighborhood. Uh, and, and again, we have we've have multiple emails and files, this person in particular, uh, July 27th, August 3rd. Uh, we've, we've done everything we can to get this information out there. In summary, we, we do regret the politics and misinformation that's recently surfaced on this development. However, we do remain convinced the proposed use is ideal for the subject property, as well as the community and the city as a whole, and hope to have your support. Uh, do note the merits of the project were contemplated by the Planning Commission to recommend they, uh, they recommended approval. Um, that being said, we, we would ask for a deferral of the final vote to try to address uh, a couple items that came up recently and, and again we, we do want to work together and be a good neighbor and, and um, our goal is not to make this a contentious process but to make it work for, for everyone involved I, I do believe in the, the merits of it and, and hope we can make it work for everyone but i appreciate your time thank you thank you um clark Hi, this is Michelle Huggins with the South. Hi, this is Michelle Huggins with the South Kilburn Neighborhood Association. 
um, we are letting you know that we are opposed to the um, development coming in with the 22 two-bedroom and 68 three-bedroom townhouse that, um, that is over in the Edisto Court community. Neighbors um, that we are finding have not been notified, and that is of a concern. The infrastructure for this development will, at this point, not be able to handle what is proposed. We are looking at 90 townhomes that will have approximately at least 100 vehicles, if not more, that will also be involved on those streets. That's not going to be able to happen with the con with the condition that the streets are in at this time. That is a commercial area that is going through in there. You come down Edisto and it turns into commerce. That is all industrial back through there. It is a he heavily trafficked area. We would really appreciate a no from city council on this. Also, please, you do need to remember that the airport has had accidents before. Even though they are few and far between, they have impacted greatly on the neighborhood. And we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Hello, this is uh, Steve Head. Um, this is Steve Hedges. I'm the manager of the Southern Region of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, a not-for-profit association and the world's largest aviation organization, representing the interests of 310,000 aircraft owners and operators, including 3,600 in South Carolina. I'm speaking today to express the OPA's concern and opposition to the proposed rezoning of land near Hamilton Owens Airport from light industrial to residential. This land is situated within the runway protection zone at the threshold of one runway run three. Federal Aviation Administration defines a runway protection zone as a trapezoidal area at the end of the runway end that serves to enhance the protection of people and property on the ground in the event an aircraft lands or crashes beyond the runway end. Properties also identified in the Hamilton Owens Airport layout plan for future property acquisition for runway extension under easement for future runway expansion. This rezoning and residential development project will eliminate the possibility of expanding the runway at uh, Hamilton Owens, and it will lead to a larger, even larger, the need for a larger runway protection zone for a new runway. This is an asset, this airport is an asset worth saving. And the um, South Carolina Aeronautics Commission has, has recognized that by opposing this runway protection zone uh, rezoning. The city staff has also opposed or, or suggests uh, that the rezoning request should be denied. Hamilton Owens has accepted nearly 5 million in FAA airport improvement grants since 2016. And those grants come with assurances that the airport will adhere to FAA airport design standards and operating requirements. Under FAA, under FAA design criteria, the airport must own the landing area. Secondly, the airport owner must have sufficient interest in the runway protection zones to protect the runway protection zones from both obstructions and incompatible land use. The FAA considers residential housing in a runway protection zone to be incompatible. In that regard, I ask the city council to deny the zoning change and request for in consideration of its future impact on aviation safety, public safety, and the airport itself. AOPA considers light industrial development as an appropriate near uh, as appropriate near general aviation airports and within a runway protection zone. Thank you. Thank you. How many more folks do we have? Um... Erica. We currently have three callers waiting there. Okay. Do it. All right. Thank you for your patience. Mm
Good afternoon. This is Mark James with Cypress Real Estate Partners. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir, Mr. James. Hey, good. Good afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to call in. Um, I am the... Lost you there, Mark. Okay, yeah, I'm back. Um, I'm the real estate broker that's representing the seller of this property and um, actually initially sold this to the um, uh, predecessor in interest to the property back in 2009. Um, the property has been vacant um, for, I don't know, 20 years probably. Um, we've been actively trying to sell it for five or six years. Um, and I certainly appreciate that. It sounds like to me we've got um, kind of a, a classic case of, of, of land use and what's compatible and what's not compatible. And I don't um, envy the situation y'all are in. Um, we've worked very closely with the city. We've, we've uh, had uh, a number of discussions with the airport commission uh, in our efforts to, to try to sell this property as well as some others. Uh, in the area that the um, that the seller or client owns, and um, you, we're caught in a little bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. The airport commission uh, feels very strongly that the property should remain uh, of commercial use, some compatible to what is there today. Uh, however, um, a number of the, the neighborhood folks and um, other kind of vested parties have wanted to see it transition away from a more um, uh, industrial distribution type use to something more compatible with the neighborhood immediately surrounding, which is residential for the most part, with the exception of what my client is doing um, uh, currently in a, in a property down the street. And so it's it's a it's a tough one um if we were to try to continue to uh, market the property for a use that would be acceptable to the airport commission um we'd run into a problem with the neighborhood associations and uh the residents in the area and here we are trying to come in with sort of a low impact residential development that um sort of runs afoul of what the airport commission wants to see and uh the thing that i have really appreciated that the developer has done in this process has tried to be sensitive to the um, to the airport commission's concerns and um, they've they've come up with a plan that to me certainly seems like we you know it certainly seems as reasonably low impact as possible uh, it does have 90 units but gosh it's almost nine acres I mean you know it's not a small piece of property um, and when you consider that it is outside of the runway protection zone, um, even under the expansion of the runway, um, it's it, it to me feels like it's a it's a reasonable request. Um, certainly, if you put a ruler down the runway and extend it on out towards Rosewood, um, the uh, Rosewood Hills project and the recently approved expansion of that um, project is, um, is is more in the runway path than this property is. And um, it just, it seems to me to be a reasonable request. I, I can't speak to, to, to some of the outreach that the um, developer has had to the neighborhood. My understanding is that they've, they've made good efforts. Maybe there's more work to do with that. Um, uh, I did hear him say that um, he's agreeable to a deferral for a couple of weeks to try to um, figure out if there's uh, some questions that need to be answered or continued review of the plan. Um, I know that in conversations with, with them that um, they're, they're looking for a win-win solution here uh, that's agreeable to everybody. And so um, it's just as, as a person who's been working on trying to sell this property for, for, for quite a long time, uh, I, I do just have to say that I feel like this is a good kind of a, a compromise for um, all the all the parties that have an interest in what goes on this property and some of the other properties around it. Um, that it you know it'll be developed in a in a thoughtful way that balances uh, sort of some conflicting desires on the property. So uh, 
with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to y'all to, to make the hard decisions you've got to make. And I appreciate you hearing me. Thank you, Mark. Take care. All right. Come Kirk. Uh, hey, this is. Hey, this is Blake Underwood with uh, Stratus Development Group. Um, I'm also a principal of Stratus Development and work closely with uh, Jeff, who's already spoke on this project. And, you know, Jeff, uh, you know, with our group, he kind of goes out and, and takes the, the front end of things and, and talks to the neighbors and, and brokers and uh, city council people, people on our project. And, I'm more on the backside uh, on the engineering and uh, uh, operations and construction side, but I'm definitely heavily involved, you know, all the way through. We work closely together. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of frustrating to get to this point on this project after we've given a lot, so much effort to reach out to all, you know, uh, city council members, neighbors, uh, airport authorities, and um, then, you know, the day of the meeting, we kind of get uh, blindsided that we haven't been reaching out and, uh, you know, we're in the runway protection zone and, but yeah, we have emails from the commission that, you know, the, the airport authority that we are not in the runway protection zone and, and, uh, you know, our engineer can speak further to that, you know, illustrating the fact that we're not in that runway protection zone. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit frustrating, but, uh, you know, we definitely have made come and, and made the best efforts to reach out to folks. Uh, the pastor at the church, which is our closest neighbor, um, working with him on, on numerous occasions and actually have approval, a letter of approval that was submitted on beha his behalf. And, um, you know, like, like Jeff noted, we've, you know, we would be happy to defer for a couple of weeks to clear up some of these issues that have popped up um, here recently that we weren't aware of, and um, if, if that's what everybody would like to see here. But we definitely think we have a good project that can fit in with the community, that's going to help out the, the 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 property that is a blight to the neighborhood right now, and with obvious environmental issues that everyone has noted already that uh, we'd be cleaning up on our own dime. You know, I don't see how that could be uh, a negative impact for, for anybody living around that, that property. But um, with that said, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Erica. Thank you. Uh, this is Pastor T. Russell Moore. I am the pastor he just spoke about uh, from Holy Nation Church that is uh, the closest neighbor to the project. Uh, I want to uh, just take a few minutes and thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to uh, speak on behalf um, of, of this project. And I want to say, first of all, that I have been in Edisto Court for 23 years. I came when Edisto Court was uh, it, uh, let, let's just say it was on the wild side and, uh, I have seen the transformation and the slow, uh, deterioration of gangs and violence in Edisto court. And this is, I think this is my second or third project where I have been uh, asked to speak on behalf of someone wanting to make major changes to Edisto court. And when Rosewood Hills came, um, I was a part of that group and uh, gave my input to Rosewood Hills. I thought it was for the betterment of the community. And I want to say right now toward anybody at the airport, the airport, the airplanes do not fly over the back of that property. Airplanes land and take off over the top of my church. I can stand in my churchyard and uh, in my front yard and watch the little sing single uh, engine Cessnas the only thing I ever see that takes over, uh, that takes off or, you know, back there or even close back there is a jet every now and then. And that is so uh, infrequent. But most airplanes that fly over that community 
actually fly over the top of my church or towards Rosewood Drive. And I want to just agree with the gentleman who spoke that the new part of Rosewood Hill that's being developed, our whole area stands, um, you know, in danger of if an airplane was to fall, it would fall somewhere on my church or somewhere in, you know, on Mitchell Street. I, I just don't see where it would fall behind the church at all. But I have met um, Mr. Kuhn. I have met him, and I found him to be uh, you know, a man of integrity and honesty. And we've sat down on several occasions, and we have talked on the phone and uh, communicated about this. And I've seen his heart that what he wants to do uh, is actually help our community. Uh, you know, and I think, that, I think that it is time now for that community to be uh, changed from, in, from light industry I do not see where the light industry has, has really added anything to Edisto Court. I do not. Uh, the last time we had a developer that wanted to do this, the Neighborhood Association uh, opposed it. I opposed them because I asked them, do any of y'all live down here? Uh, do any of y'all live on, on, on Mitchell Street right here in this area? Not many did, and especially our city councilwoman. She did not live on Mitchell Street or Edisto Court. And I said, do you not realize the impact that having uh, homes or people owning their own homes in this community would actually do for us? It will help drive uh, getting our streets repaired, getting, uh, getting our infrastructure redone. Uh, and we really need that in that community. And in order to have that, I believe I, the city, uh, nobody else has taken any interest in changing uh, Mitchell Street, Edisto Court, uh, for a long time. Rosewood Hills is basically the first development that we've had that actually uh, brought some improvement, and that's not industry, that's housing. Uh, I don't know whether it's condo apartment, uh, but uh, that's housing. And I think that we need more housing in that community to bring uh, more a sense of more community there. You know, a safe environment, uh, more community there, instead of Instead of you know industries and then yeah, you know many it. of them, sir. Using it. Please, please, I, con I, please continue, I, I, sir. Yeah. Please continue. Please continue, Pastor. Okay, um, I uh, really believe you know that uh, if we have more homes and people living in those homes, it will provide a yeah. much safer environment. Well. And so you know. Every night when I go to my church and I do my, my online studies, you know, um, I, I still, there's it, it, dark areas in that, in that community because I'm right there. Sure. And, and there are dark spots, dark areas, and, and it's really not safe. And we've got industry there now. So I would really like to see uh, this project come to fruition. I would really like to see homes there. It would, it would, we have several churches in the area and they've all gone down uh, my church is still doing good but but most of the churches in the area have gone down because of the change in the area you know and on our part it's really really been dilapidated you know when you look at when you look at the, the structure and the buildings and everything you know edisto court needs a facelift it needs a change thank it you, needs uh, some new development the okay thank Thank you. No, thank you. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Message is loud and clear. I appreciate you, Doc. Appreciate you. All, All right. right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Be well. All right. Madam Clerk. All right. Again, we thank you all for your patience. That concludes our public input at this time. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Brennan. Yes. I, first, let me ask Erica, is there something uh, going on with the screen share right now? I'm getting a lot of uh, Councilman McDowell uh, my, uh, on my screen. My, but, um, my... <laughs> um, you may need to change the setting, uh, but we're about to take down the video, the presentation, so that might help. Perfect. I like you, Ed, but not that many of you. Man, they can't. I, it won't. Uh, something's going on with it. Let's see. Oh, Will, there we go. Will and then Tamika. Will. Yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for for um, everybody's comments, uh, both for against. Um, 
I, I, you know, I, I'm a little uneasy on just, we need to clarify what the FFA criteria is first and foremost. Uh, there's a lot of different, different legalese being thrown out there. And that always makes me nervous when we enter into one of these. Um, and not just for a change of use, but just uses in the future, future uses for growth for that uh, corridor, which I agree with the pastor. Absolutely, there's great things coming to that area if we all put our minds to it and our efforts. Um, so, I, you know, the, the the property owner owns a lot of property that um, is a major uh, puzzle piece to any growth in that area. So I would like to um, uh, echo the deferral comments to, to uh, get around the table with the uh, airport folks and the property owner and um, really talk about, you know, what, what does the future hold uh, for that as in a parallel track to clarify the FFA or the FAA criteria that are, um, that are being talked about, Mr. Mayor. Right. Is that a second? Uh, motion? second. Uh, further discussion. Uh, I, that, that's really just what I was going to say, Mr. Mayor. I mean, I think certainly there's a lot of questions here. Um, you know, as, as someone who talks a lot about having more workforce housing and, and looking at the pictures, the, the project itself seems like a quality project. My only concern would be the safety regulations. And I think that we don't really have uh, clarity around that. So I would like to get more clarity around that. And certainly, Councilman Brennan, I will offer myself if you want to pull together a group of folks to just discuss the project and how do we figure out, you know, what what really the law is and an opportunity that maybe we could bring folks together um, for a workable solution. Absolutely. Right. Is, is, is there any further discussion? Uh, I don't think so. All right. It's um, with the previous question. Previous question, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rickman. Are you? Are you do you have your hand up, Daniel? Are you uh, uh, taking on? Okay. I just, is Will going to make a motion? Yeah, he, 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 he has. He has. And Howard seconded. Um, Ms. Devine is as well. Um, let's move the previous question, uh, Madam Clerk. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? You're gonna mute Ed. Can't hear you. Uh, we're we're doing a roll call on item. Roll call on 30. to defer action. All right. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Yes. Mr. Fine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Hi, and thank you. And thank you to all the citizens and, and other interested parties who, uh, who called in to make sure the voices were heard. Uh, we'll we'll um, see Mr. Brennan and uh, Ms. Devine uh, moving this discussion along. So thank you. Madam City Manager. Or, or Krista, I'm sorry. It's, it's, been, it's been a couple of days uh, since we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we just have a few more items that, that should yes, be fairly quick. The, your next item is a zoning map amendment at 1801 Assembly Street. This is a request to rezone the parcel from C1DD um, to C4DD. This is the old Veterans Administration building. All right, is anyone here speaking in favor of or against this? Madam Clerk? No, anyone? All right. Okay. Motion by Mr. McDowell. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion. Exciting opportunity. We'll move the previous question. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. The next two cases are rezonings to apply the design preservation or landmark designation to these structures at the owner's request. The first one is at 1601 Hampton Street. 
again, a request to apply the DP overlay to designate the structure as a group three landmark. Or is there um, anyone here speaking in favor of or against this? No, clerk. No, sir. All right. Uh, is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Say no with the previous question. Clerk, Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. I want to note for item, I'm sorry, we done with 39, Krista? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I note for item 40 that Ms. Devine is going to accuse herself from participation in this discussion. All right, and this is your last item. It is a zoning map and text amendment, 2531 Gervais Street. A request to apply the EP overlay to designate the smaller structures on the parcel as a group three landmark. Is anyone here to speak in favor of or against this item? No, sir. Thank you, Member. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Right. Move, Mr. Uh, McDowell, second by Mr. Rickman. Any discussion? We'll move the previous question. Clerk, call a roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. And that concludes your zoning public hearing. Thank you. Bye. Is it still Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Krista. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, all right, let's keep let's keep on moving. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Krista. One appointment today, Mayor Benjamin and Council for the Fire Advisory Committee. I sent you an email um, and follow up to Ashley's email. Um, Chief Jenkins and I have been working to get this committee reestablished with the county administrator. And um, just need two appointments for the council, please. I move we appoint Mr. Rickerman and Mr. Brennan to represent the city. Second. Right. Move and second. Any discussion? All right. Um, move the previous question for Carl. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Excellent. Thank you so much. We have a little bit more work to go, um, Councilman Brennan, and recommend it. We'll be letting you know. Thank and you for organizing, Teresa. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Erica, do you have public? Well, I guess we need to do our committee referrals and reports first. All right. Yeah, are there any uh, reports of committee or referrals to committee? All right. Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. Um, we have anyone, uh, Erica, anyone else who signed up for public input? No, sir. All right. All right. Uh, well, Mr. Duval, you have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move we go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to 30-4-70A2 COVID-19 street planning discussions of negotiations as the proposed contractual arrangement pursuant to 30-4-70A2 Capital City Stadium. Mr. Mayor, could I add the canal to the contractual item, please? Item 40. Absolutely. Uh, with that one addition, is there a second to Mr. Duval's motion? Second. second. Any discussion? Uh, see any? Move the previous question. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? 
Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. 